Hi, everybody. Welcome into Sports Talk Chicago. Great to see everybody here with us on all of our great radio and TV affiliates across Illinois and Indiana. WKAN 105.5, the ticket ACTV, Jed TV, WJOB, and Cities 92.9 Talk. My name's John Zaglul. John Meadows is directing and producing. We have a huge guest joining us right here in just a second. Remember, you can follow us all over at Sports Talk Chicago. Subscribe to the YouTube page at Sports Talk Chicago. Give us a thumbs up on this video if you enjoy it. And I really appreciate everybody being here tonight for a huge guest, somebody that we need to talk about who comes on right around this time every year. And we're certainly excited to have him here with us. He's a seven-time All-Star current baseball Hall of Fame candidate, which we're going to get to a lot in this interview, and the head baseball coach at the Miller School. Please welcome the MLB legend Billy Wagner to the program. Billy, it's great to see you. How are you? Oh, I'm great, John. It's always great to be back and always, always fun to talk with you. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to have you back here. Certainly looking forward to this conversation. Uh, wanted to start by talking about your coaching. First of all, how did this past year go for you down at the middle at the Miller School? Well, well you know, high school baseball is always, uh, it, you never know what you're going to get with young men and women. Uh, you know, it, it, it has been fun. Uh, I think uh, you're, it's always fun when you're dealing with development, and that's your, your main concern. Uh, and I think going through pro ball and everything that I've been able to, to experience and being able to pass that down, um, you know, has been great to be able to, to share with these young men and women. You know, I have some tremendous athletes. Uh, you know, I think somebody that stands out is a, a young lady that I coach, Naomi Ryan, who is uh, on the U.S. women's uh, Olympic team. And, you know, being able to be an advocate for her and push push her and um, along with the other young men who are working to want to, want to get to where I've been. Uh, you know, those are things that I really get excited about. And, and I tell you, I probably lose more sleep over that than I have anything else. <laughs> so how is it for you to kind of develop all these kids? As you said, they're all trying to make it to where you were. What's that like from your perspective already being there and being this MLB legend? Well, I think a lot of it's just being being realistic and, and letting them know that you're in high school and trying to be the best high school ball player that you can be before you start looking into the major leagues. And you know, having having that experience, it, it's easy to sit there and, and have that discussion about what what you know, these major league players actually look like. When you look at a Freddie Freeman and you you look at some of these guys that are monsters, that you know you you can't see that on TV. You you just can't experience it until you're in that dugout, in that locker room, and you walk by these guys and you just go, "Wow, these guys are monsters." Jason Hayward, the guys like that are just monsters. And so I think having having that that view allows me to sit there and go, hey, let's be the best high school player. Let's let's really develop that and then move on. And you know, you know, I've been so blessed. God's blessed me so much by being able to sit there and, and have some really really talented players. I've got I think eight players that are in uh, pro ball now. Uh, I think I have uh, three that are in Triple A that are right on the cusp of getting their their debut. So I, I mean, you know, I've been blessed to have that type of talent that come through, and you know, being able to travel and do things with these guys, give them experiences, and it has been very uh, worthwhile. And you you can see that in their growth. As a developmental coach, you talk about all this success that you've had with some of your past players. Is there? an ability for you or a want for you to move up from the high school level, maybe teach college or even go to the minor, or even major league level? Well, yeah, I, I mean, it would have to be the, the, the perfect situation by far. But I think the biggest thing that I enjoy in the high school is that mentorship, having that relationship to be able to talk to them, to really be real. I, I think the NCAA hampers you with uh, coaches with the ability to, to have the relationship, to really, really focus on the, development and growth of the game. I, I think now the game has become, if you're not, you know, this monster by the time you're in the 10th grade, you've already, you're, you're done. You can't, you can't play at these levels. I, I you know, thank God that I was before this because, you know, I feel like I would have been one of those kids that probably doesn't, uh, you know, I probably don't get that opportunity today that I got back then because people, you know, uh, you know, I was very raw. Now, nowadays, you have to be so much better. Uh, my son's a pitcher. My youngest son's a pitcher, and he is ten times better than I was when I was in high school. 
but you sit here and they, they, they are very much, you know, they're scrutinized and stuff through the social media. When you turn on that social media, all of a sudden you automatically go, oh my gosh, look at this, look at this 12 year old throwing 95 and you're like, holy gosh, what, I, what do I do to get better? How do I do this? And so that's part of me and what I enjoy the most is like saying, hey, let's, let's just enjoy the game. Let's really enjoy what the game, the pureness of the game. So, you know, and like other teams that we played, you know, I, I bunt and hit and run and, you know, I, I work those types of things and, you know, try to play the game as uh, truthful as, as possible. But uh, I, I think the game has changed in large amounts just because of the social media. And so just playing that, you know, kind of playing in between and trying to keep guys in, in check is, uh, has been, a, you know, a joy for me because I know how difficult it is. Do you think some of those purest strategies should be utilized more in Major League Baseball? What do you think about the direction of that part of the game today? Well, I, you know, I think what's unique about today's game, um, and I, I'm hoping I'm answering this correctly, uh, is that, you know, we, we're wanting to speed the game up. We're wanting to, make, we're wanting right. to cut out some of the dead air. Well, I get that. And that's fine. I, you know, I think the bigger bases are great. I think the, the clock is great. I have no problem with the clock. I think, you know, by the time you're in the big leagues, you pretty much know what you need to do and what your, your strengths and weaknesses are. So, you you know, you, you should know how to, to move quickly. I think, you know, uh, the minor leaguers today, have um, they have a much better attitude on it and they have made that, you know, uh, adjustment. Uh, but, but, I, but, I mean, you know, uh, the, the pureness of the game is still the bunts. You know, now the bunt is going to become the steal is getting back in more into it because now you can only pick off at a certain time. You know, now, you, now you've got pitching coaches strategizing, when do I pick off? All right, when am I stealing it? Two seconds in the, in, into the pitch clock, I, I can do these things. And so now you're tinkering with these things. So I think there's still scheme and, and then stuff, you know. I mean, I'm a traditionalist, so I was all about the DH. I thought that was great. Uh, I wasn't a very good hitter. That's why I was a pitcher. And so now, <laughs> you know, uh, I like that DH. I like being able to pinch hit and do some things uh, in that fashion. But I, I think, uh, you know, they're, you know, facing a straight nine with the DH now, you know, uh, it is a little different. Uh, you know, that was an American league thing and you you got to enjoy it but now now you experience it throughout the league and and stuff did you ever get in that bat in the major league game unfortunately yes <laughs> and i say that i say that you know uh you know very rarely did i get a bat that i wanted because if i got in that bat i usually sucked some way and i had to stay in the game and i blew a save or something like that but occasionally <laughs> You know, I would I would get that at bat where we were winning. I had to come in and hold a lead. I got that lead, and so my bat came up and stuff like that. Now, you know, the good thing is I that that is one of those experiences that you know I get to hold over uh, these kids that I do have two hits in the big leagues, and that you know uh, it's not as difficult as they keep making it out to be. But <laughs> but and now my my oldest son plays and he's in Triple A, and now. You know, he 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 got actually got to pitch two innings in a ball in a blowout game and threw scoreless, and so he gives me a hard time talking about how easily it is to pitch. And so, you know, <laughs> it, it, you know, it does give a good perspective when you're when you're you all you've done is pitch and now you get in a bat here and there. It does give a good perspective of like hitting is not as easy as it looks when all you're doing is pitching. But uh, you know, uh, that was fun. I mean, my bats. Some of my bats weren't as fun as I expected when you're facing Nin and some of these guys that you know throw very hard and really good stuff. You can really look foolish, but I, I had fun with it. I would tell the catcher, I'm like, hey, can you do this? Because I really want to see what this looks like. And so <laughs> they go out there. I mean, I'm striking out anyway, buddy. Come on, it doesn't really matter what you throw. Let's just let's. I want to see what all these guys are clamoring about. So to be able to get to see those things, you know, that was fun. Billy Wagner, MLB legend, here with us on Sports Talk Chicago. Billy. What's the key to being a good closer? Having a good manager. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, it really is. And so, have somebody that believes in you keeps giving you a chance. I mean, you can't have numbers if you don't have somebody that's going to, you know, uh, weather some of the storms that a closer goes through. Because no matter how good you are, you know, uh, you're going to have a bad week. You're going to have a bad weekend. I mean, I think we've all had, you know, every closer that's ever played has had press where it's talked about, 
not being the same or you're, you're, you know, is this the end? I mean, I'm, you know, playing in New York. I, I read articles about Mo. I read articles about Trevor and Johnny Franco and Rob Nin and all these guys that, uh, you know, Lee Smith. I mean, you, you just can't have it. Just you have that. But what I think is amazing is when you have the manager to just, can weather that storm and sticks by you and keep putting you out there. And I did. Larry Durker was great, letting me learn how to to be that closer and have consistency. And when you have that, when you're a good closer, it's because that manager is giving you chances to keep going out there. And then you figure it out how to rebound from a bad game. And you can't you can't have success without the failure. And you you can't make these these adjustments without it. And so. Um, you know, I, I, I really contribute a lot to Terry Collins, uh, Larry Durker. I mean, uh, you know, these guys, Jimmy Williams and, and guys just continue to give me that opportunity when I was in, in Houston to, to be that closer and get those chances. How did you do it for so many years? You see closers today with, at times, a shorter shelf life in Major League Baseball. You lasted for a long time, put up 420-plus saves. How did you do it? Well, I, I mean, you just, I, I think love, the, the love of going out there every day. I loved, when, when I came up, I was a starter, and I hated right. starting. Um, you know, it, it was good on the day you started, but it, the, the other four days was not, not much fun because you were, you were thinking about that start or whatever, but there was something about being, you know, you felt like an everyday player as a closure. You could go out every day and compete. You had a role to play. You could, you had to be on the edge. You weren't just sitting in the dugouts and thinking about what, what, uh, what was going on and what was happening and you knew that three run lead you got to be ready you knew what time that lineup was how it was being flipped and who to be ready for and there was something having that mentality of every day being ready and i mean you know that that just that was the fun part and the joy of the game going to the park every day knowing that you had a chance to play and so uh, that that was you know and that goes back to if you're successful you, you know you get to play more and so that was a, that was a joy, and you know, we I was on a ton of good teams that gave me those opportunities. And when you play on teams that are good, you you get those opportunities, and it gives you that longevity. Let me ask you this: What was the most dominant save or appearance that you made in your career, if you could recall? The most dominant appearance for a save? Yes. Gosh, I don't know. I think uh, I tell you, I think. Uh, there's a couple, I think, that really stand out. And I think the two that stand out to me was probably real early in my career against San Francisco in Houston. And um, it, it, it was, I, I came in the game, and I think Bagwood made an error. I think Biggio makes an error. Um, I walk a guy. I've, I've, uh, I've got one out. You know, uh, Randy Nor comes out, and, you know, being green and naive is really a blessing. So, but he comes out and he goes, hey, man, we're going to throw six fastballs here and we're going to the house. So I'm like, okay, here we go. Well, the next two guys I'm facing is um, Barry Bonds and Matt Williams. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, so, you know, that was the first introduction to a high pressure situation. And I ended up punching out the side you know, or punching those two guys out. And so you're like, okay, you know, and, every, and that was when you got that respect. I remember back one of them, that's when everybody were like, oh, wait a minute, this guy's special. This could be something unique and, and stuff. But, I, And then I think the, the, the next one might have been, uh, and that's because it's probably closer to the end of my career, but uh, and, I, and I can remember it, is uh, I think it was for my 400 save against Detroit in Atlanta, and I punched out uh, the side. Uh, you know, I think there was, uh, you know, I'm sure there's a few other ones, but I, I think those stand out because – I think the San Francisco really gave me everybody stood up, took notice of what I did against those two great hitters. Um, but I mean, I think, uh, you know, to get to that 400th and punch out the side still showed that dominance. So, I, I mean, there was some, I'm sure there were many, I think, you know, uh, the no, you know, there was, there, there were probably plenty more, but I think uh, those stood out to me right off the top of my head. How did 400 feel for you when you got to the 400 mark? What did it feel like? Well, because there was no real, nobody knew what the Hall of Fame number was for a closer. You know, no, it hadn't been established at all. If you get this save, you're on making like a 300 wins and 3,000 hits and all these things. You didn't, you didn't know. So 
400 seemed to be like that might be the number that kind of said like, hey, this established you as a dominating player. You get into the Hall of Fame. You know, you have credentials, you know, that kind of thing. But um, that night going out there, I remember running it, and you know, um, you really don't realize how many people know about this, and you don't. You and that night, uh, you know, I come in. I had some of my college teammates that were having to be there. Um, you know, the, 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 it was packed house. Um, and, uh, I remember running out and it just felt different. It was kind of like that, that, you know, just in, in the zone type thing where you're kind of out of body and it felt like you were just white and it was just very, it was just one of those easy nights where you punched outside and it didn't seem, it didn't seem like you put a lot into it. It was just effortless. And it's just one of those magical nights that you, you have occasionally. And, uh, and that's and that's how that that felt. But you know, knowing that, you also thought that that was leading to something bigger. So I assume you kind of had an idea. Hey, this is significant. This is a big deal that I got to four hundred. Uh, I, yeah, I, there hadn't been many. I think at that time there was only uh, a handful of guys. And, and I mean, uh, you know, since then I think uh, Frankie Rodriguez, I think uh, uh, Kimbrel and uh, Kenley have gotten it since then but i think at that point there was only four or five of us so yeah it was significant knowing that uh what you'd established and, and stuff and so that that seemed to be the the staple point you know not really knowing uh you know what what it really was and it, because closures weren't valued quite like uh i should I, and i don't really want to use mariano as a as a closer because he was he was a completely different animal when he he played he, he was he wasn't so for, for some of the, the lower level closers, I guess we'll call them, you know, we, you know, that seemed, you know, big deal. And I should add Hoffman too, because Lord have mercy, those two got so many saves together. I mean, you know, they named an award after them. So I, I think those are unique, those are two unique. I think everybody else in that 400 are kind of in that situation where you feel like, you know, that's the number and your dominance shows, shows the, the efficiency. Let's talk about the big news out there. The cat's out of the bag. It's your ninth year on the ballot out of 10 for the Baseball Hall of Fame. What do you make of your Hall of Fame case today? Well, I'm not a very good car salesman, so I, I know that if I go talking about my candidacy, it's, it's not going to go very well, so I'm only <laughs> going to shoot myself in the foot. But I, I, I think when you talk about those things, and I, I think what I, what I would like to talk about when we talk about my candidacy is like the Todd Helton's. You know the Gary Sheffields, the guys like that. That uh, you know the Andrew Jones, uh, guys like that are similar situations. I am. We're on the cusp. There's a, there's a, those. You know, we we did it the right way. There was no steroid implications. Your name wasn't leaked out there to anything. I think things like that. Uh, I think you you know being a stand up person. You know answering the call. Not always being the best. I, I mean I was I've always been known for for having very good <laughs> interviews because I was never afraid to, to, to step away and probably should have at times. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but I, I think, you know, when, when you view yourself with these type of candidates and you watch the, and you know what Andrew Jones was when he stepped in uh, when he was young and the difference he made in a team, I, I, don't, I don't, Greg Maddox didn't Greg Maddox without Andrew Jones. Uh, neither is Glavin. The, I mean, the runs that the normal center fielder gives up is different than what Andrew Jones gives up. And it's, you're, you're, you're a different player. And so for every good closer, there was so many people behind you that made these great plays. And I mean, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. Wouldn't have had the success I had today if I hadn't had those types of players. And so when you think about the Sheffields and their abilities to go out and do what they did on a consistency, and I mean, I think Gary's got like close to 1,500 or 1,500 RBIs or something like that. I mean, those are those are substantial. Those are big time things. And I and I mean, he he's you know, and I think Andrew Jones and Todd Hilton playing in 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 the era that he did. And, and I don't care where you play, you still got to produce. I mean, you know, we can talk about this all all we want. But I think those guys, uh, you know, I'm excited for those guys. You know, it would be you know. I think Adrian Beltrani will definitely go in. I think there will be no doubt about that. He's He was a great player from the day he stepped on the field. So, you know, I'm happy about that. It's fun to watch that 
uh, Jim Leland being in the Hall of Fame is fantastic and well overdue. You know, what a, what a great stigma, what a, just a personality for the game, uh, true champion. Uh, for myself, to be put in that situation is an honor. To be on that page, to be looked at uh, in that way is an honor. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to stand here and say that, you know, the way I feel about myself, I did what I was supposed to do. As my grandfather said, I didn't do anything that I wasn't supposed to do. So going out and winning games and striking people out and doing, getting saves is what I was paid to do. So uh, those are difficult questions for me to answer because I feel that uh, those those are for the, the, the guys that I played against. To, they, they're the ones that should be an, answering, is Billy Wagner a Hall of Famer? Those are the guys that I think that I respect. What have any of your peers, if you know, said about you and about your candidacy in terms of the Hall of Fame? Well, you know, I think a few guys. I think, you know, you know Trevor came out and saying, saying he thought I was a Hall of Famer, which is always good when you have your peers that are already in. Uh, Chipper, Tom Glavin, Bagwell, and Biggio. Um, you know, there, there's, been a, there's been a handful. There's been, I'm sure, plenty. I, I don't know right off the top of my head, but I know that, um, you know, those are guys that, you know, the press has reached out to to find out what they think. And I, I think when guys that are in the Hall of Fame, can can say that I think they know what a Hall of Famer is. I think they have an idea. And so when you reach out, you know, you know, especially guys you played with, guys you played with, they know you inside and out. They know you in the locker room. They know you on the bus rides. They know you in the flights. They know you on the field, off the field. They know all these things. And so when you when you get that type of pat on the back by a Chipper Jones or Jeff Bagwell, they've seen you good and bad. They've seen all the things, the positive things, the times you talked about their family more and you talked about their, their bad. I, I think there's, you know, we talk about the character, those types of things. Those are the guys that I think, you know, that's why I think those those types of guys mean more. And I think, you know, I, I mean, why players, when they have, when they, they, they should probably have more of an impact on who they think it's it, it's not a biased thing when you you do have dominance you know and, and i think it's very easy when you don't know players like i mean i wouldn't expect a guy out in california to know billy wagner i mean you know uh, we I, I wasn't out there a lot uh, but but i think when you talk and, and you you meet a billy wagner it, you see a difference when you're when you're when you're in the batter's box and people see it's different. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, for me, all I can do by talking about my candidacy is shoot myself in the foot. <laughs> How have you felt about the recent growth of support for you, though? I mean, you debuted around, what, 10.5%? Last yeah. year you got up to 68%. You still have two years left. How have you felt about that growth in general? Well, you know, in a lot of ways, surprised. Uh, <laughs> I'm surprised. I mean, I, you know, I really <laughs> stopped looking. Uh, last year was a total shock. I mean, that you know that 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 jumped that way, and I, I think it's made this year a little bit harder, of course, because now, you know, 27 votes out. You know, uh, Jesus Ortiz has been a good friend of mine who has really pushed for my candidacy uh, and, and and talking and, and and to other people and you know trying to get people to to be a Billy Wagner supporter. Uh, you know, and, and I'm really, really thankful for, for him and, and, and that. And then Gene Diaz in, in, uh, uh, in Houston has been very good for me, pushing out that uh, my agenda for that. And Jay Horowitz for the Mets. That he's been, Jay's been fantastic and always been a big supporter. Uh, you know, you know it, it's, it's great to see this jump, but it is nerve-wracking because you know that 27 votes are very hard to get. And, you know, and that's that's like getting those last three outs in the ninth inning. It's those are the hardest ones to get. And so, you know, trying to talk to people and that's something I, I don't do. So I'm not reaching out to people. I don't know half these people, you know, I, and I and I don't want to go out there and sway somebody and, because I don't I don't know them. They don't know me. And I don't think it's right to to do that. You either like me and believe that this is because you've seen me compete and you know where those stats are and, and you, you have a true feel and it's not, it's, it's a true unbiased feel. That's, that's the way it should be. So I, you know, I, I'm very happy. Hopefully, you know, somehow, some way, you know, I get 27 
get 75 percent uh, to, to make that that jump how do you feel around this time of year i mean it sounds like clearly and understandably you're a bit nervous i mean this year and the next you only got two years left you're, you're so close what, what are those feelings like inside of you when this time comes around well it's more when i do these interviews that I start to really get nervous <laughs> because we, we talk about it. You know, I, I have no idea where I stand right now. I have no idea where I stand with in, in, in the uh, in voting. Uh, you know, I, I don't I, I don't pay attention to it because I'm not good with disappointment. I, you know, I, I mean, um, you know, I think my kids know about it more than I do. I think it's one of the best when you you are you see um, you know people write the negative things. So, you know, that you can't control and your kids read it. And, you know, those are the toughest part. Those are the tough. And so, you know, not my advice. It's just been, you know, I don't want to know that. I just say, I don't want to know, you know, uh, you know, these things are, you know, I think it is what it is. I think if it's meant to be, it'll be. Uh, but at this point, you know, I'm, I'm gearing up for spring baseball. And so, uh, you know, I've got New Year's coming up. I'm going to hang out with my family, go watch my daughter in Nashville play basketball and then I'm just gonna you know really dive into that that baseball the high school baseball and take my mind and uh, a lot of that pressure off of me what would it mean to you if you got in well I mean I mean it's you know that's what we all play for I mean you, you play for rings and to be and, and I feel like when you're voted in there is a substantial respect for you and what you've done for the game and how you went about playing that game and, you know, your character in the game. Uh, I think there's something that there's just a, a huge effect that, that you're able to, to, to feel and a pride that I don't think, uh, you know, it's something you can you describe until you get there. I, I think thinking back and, and thinking about the guys that went before you and watching millions and millions of these it feels like they're, they're, they're Hall of Fame speeches. I mean, you know, going back and, and listening to some of the media talk about guys who, how they practiced. And it, it just, it, it's, you know, I know it'll be very emotional. I know it'll be, uh, you know, you know I, I don't even know what day it even comes out. But, I mean, I'm, I'm sure somebody will let me know. And, you know, I'm sure that day, if I do happen to get a, a call, it'll be uh, – you know, I know I'll be on a baseball field when I get the call, so it'll be, you know, pretty uh, pretty emotional. You had mentioned earlier people like Andrew Jones, Todd Helton, uh, Larry Walker recently got in. Do you feel like your case, your candidacy, provides some hope for people like that who didn't really have a lot of support to begin with, but their support like yours has grown greatly? Well, I, I definitely. I think people get to know you a little bit more the more you're on the ballot. I think people get to look at... Andrew Jones, the Sheffields, the Heltons, uh, a little longer, and, and really get to dive into just how great they really are. And you know, I've been blessed to be be on this ballot this long. And you know, uh, and, and when you look back at guys who have been on this ballot before and and didn't get in, and, and then went to the Veterans Committee, I mean, Lee Smith, I mean, is the epitome of of you know that. You know, e even the Fred McGriff, uh, guys like that. Uh, I mean, are you know, great examples of what can happen, you know, so you can't give up hope. I think, uh, you know, being on this ballot gives you a, a you know, you know, is really a, a, it should give you some pride and some hope. And, and, and the longer you're on here, the, 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 you should, the more you have a shot at getting into that, to uh, the, getting to the ultimate prize. So, you know, I think, I think, you know, guys will get in, I think, you know, I really hope that Gary Sheffield gets in this year, and I really hope that Todd gets in. I know he's really super close, and I think that uh, Andrew will definitely get in. And I, I think that, you know, hopefully, you know, uh, somehow there's 27 voters out there that, you know, feel, feel like I'm worthy. So, you know, fingers crossed, I guess. I will say this. I know you said you didn't want to make your case. I'll make it for you for an extent. This is me talking, not you. So I want to make your case just for a second here. More strikeouts per nine than Trevor Hoffman. Better ERA plus than Trevor Hoffman. Um, better ERA in general than Hoffman. Now, you made less appearances, of course. But nevertheless, the rate stats show that there was dominance for a long, long period of time from 95 to 2010. 
So, you know, you don't even have to react to that necessarily, but the numbers are there to support your case. And I hope that more voters see that here with two years left to go. Well, I, I mean, and I mean, that's what longevity gets you, right? I mean, there's so many numbers out there anymore. And when you, you think about dominance and what really is your grading factor, I mean, that's what you're looking for. And so when you're looking for, you know, where, where was he dominant? I mean, in 16 years, the league hit 187 against you. I mean, what, what else do you want him to do? I mean, um, you know, 33% of the time I was striking somebody out. I mean... Those are those are things that, and, and I mean, when I hope that when people are thinking about, hey, you know, do I want to vote for this guy or not, that they're think they're not thinking about, you know, anything more than just the numbers, because the numbers are what you're graded on, not, you know, you know, not knowing somebody or or somebody hearsay. It, it there, you know, until you know the person, you can't really talk about character. Billy Wagner still here with us on Sports Talk Chicago. Billy, a uh, few more questions here before we finish up. First off, how did you become a left-handed pitcher? <laughs> well, you would think, uh, you know, I, I've done it myself, but I, I did, it was luck. Honestly, pure luck. Uh, playing football in, in my grandmother's front yard and getting tackled and fell on and breaking my, my right arm. And uh, then going out uh, shortly after that, couple months later I think it was and uh, on the monkey bars and falling and breaking it again so I mean you know obviously God God is real and has a real purpose for you because there's no way that that happens and I, I turn left-handed and, and able to throw 100 miles an hour so you know I just you know there, there was something to that and very blessed in, in that regards but I don't think anybody was looking at that from at that point when I was growing up but uh, man it's crazy to think how how things are now when you look back at how that all transpires. And Billy, before we finish up today, last question. Um, how's your faith impacted your baseball career and your life here today? I'd love to hear it. Well, you know, when you, when you come from where I came from, broken home, you come from uh, and, and going through multiple sc- uh, schools and breaking your arm and being going from right hand to left hand, I mean, I think... Um, faith plays a huge part because I know that God is real and God's working through me because of what he's allowed me to accomplish. Um, you know, the light that he's put on me to be uh, a positive influence to kids and young adults uh, to help in, in those moments. Uh, you know, baseball was the podium for me to be on, to give me that opportunity. And I think you know, God's using that for for me to help other people that may not have, you know, a strong belief or, or understand, you know, or go through a tough time. And just to know that, you know, great things come from struggles. And a lot of times when you're struggling, you know, he, that's that test. And, you know, and I think God gave, has given us tests every, every day. And, you know, I think that that was just one of those tests that allowed me to get to this. Point. And I think, uh, you know, without... God being in my life, I couldn't have been successful. I don't think I would have my wife and my kids, uh, a career. I don't think I would be able to do any of those successful things without having that blessing in my life. And so, you know, uh, you know, my grandparents from day one woke up in the morning reading the Bible and went to bed reading the Bible. And, and to this day, I wake up in the morning and I read the Bible because I think that that's the part that keeps me whole. And that it's the probably only thing in my life that I feel is a, a real fulfillment is reading God's word and knowing that he's got a plan for me. Billy, I love it. Um, I always love having you on. You are welcome anytime. It's always beyond a pleasure to have you. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing these results come out again for any writer listening, vote for Billy Wagner. Don't, don't be an idiot. Don't leave him off. Vote for Billy Wagner, put him on your ballot. That way he can get into the hall of fame. And uh, Billy, looking forward to staying in touch, man, and having you on again soon. Oh, anytime, John. It's always a pleasure. I appreciate it.